Thank you, everybody, for coming to the Aaron Torres Podcast YouTube page. I do have one quick favor before we get to the video that you came here for, and that is very simply this. You see that little red subscribe button below this video? Go ahead, smash that subscribe button. It really does help me. It really does help this channel grow and my audience grow. So go ahead and hit that red subscribe button. And now, here is the video that you came here for. All right, let's talk about the big topic of the week in college football, and that is, of course... The Tennessee Volunteers talked about it a lot on Monday's episode of the Aaron Torres Sports Podcast, but the story continues to evolve so many layers. We had the McDonald's stuff on Tuesday. On Wednesday, some bad news as Henry Toto, the starting star linebacker, entered the transfer portal as well as a couple other players. But look, the Jeremy Pruitt era is officially over, and so with that, we do have to move on, and we do have to figure out the next big question, which is who is going to be the next head football coach at the University of Tennessee? And before we can even begin to talk about who's going to be the next head coach at the University of Tennessee, I think there's a couple important things that need to be noted. First of all, while everybody on Monday was focused on Jeremy Pruitt's firing, I would argue that Philip Fulmer being forced out as the AD is largely maybe even bigger than the Jeremy Pruitt firing, right? Because if you're just firing a football coach because he stinks, well, you go out, you try to hire somebody better. The issue is Jeremy Pruitt was fired, of course, because of these NCAA allegations, but also uh, with him went his boss. And so before we can even start the conversation of who should be the next head coach at the University of Tennessee, I think it's important to note we probably have to first figure out who is going to be the athletic director at the, Ten at the University of Tennessee. Because I think in any walk of life, this is something that we can all relate to. Nobody leaves a job they have or takes a job if they don't know who their boss is going to be. And so college football is no different. It is going to be hard to get a head coach that currently has a job to leave the place that they're at, or even a, a coach that is currently living the buyout life, getting paid to not coach. It's going to be hard to get that guy to leave his current situation without knowing who the head, who, without knowing who the athletic director is going to be. So I think the first thing is we got to figure out who the heck is going to be the athletic director at Tennessee. And then two, I think it'd be also remiss if we didn't mention that, oh, by the way, uh, until we figure out a little bit more about these NCAA sanctions, it's also going to be interesting to see who is actually interested in this coaching job because of the fact that a coach is kind of walking into a situation where they have no idea just how bad it was, just what the NCAA knows, just what the NCAA is going to find out, and then furthermore, uh, what the long-term punishments could be. And if we've learned one thing from this college basketball probe by the FBI, it's that sometimes an NCAA investigation takes two, three, four years to figure out. And so when a guy is trying to figure out if he wants to take this Tennessee head coaching job, he's got to figure out, okay, how do I recruit in the short term, but also how do I recruit in the long term without knowing what these NCAA rules violations are going to be? So these are all important things to consider when we talk about who the next head coach at the University of Tennessee is going to be. On the flip side, I would also say this. I think it's being a little over dramatized the fact that this Tennessee coaching job isn't a quote unquote good job. That is hogwash, that is ridiculous, that is BS, that is nonsense. Uh, and if you just think back to the last head coaching search, never forget. There, was, there were reports that in the middle of that craziness involving Greg Schiano that led to Jeremy Pruitt, that Dan Mullen actually was a, a serious candidate and would have taken the Tennessee job had the Florida job not been open. If you remember, Dan Mullen was actually the third choice in that Florida job behind Scott Frost, who was then the Central Florida coach, behind Chip Kelly. And when Scott Frost went, to Central, went from Central Florida to Nebraska, when Chip Kelly went to UCLA, it was only then that Dan Mullen came in. But had he not, he was interested in taking the Tennessee job. Mike Leach, the current Mississippi State coach, also showed interest in that Tennessee job. So let's stop with this idea that Tennessee isn't a good job. It's still in the weaker division of the SEC. It is still a, a school that is in the middle of a fertile recruiting base with Charlotte four hours away, Atlanta four hours away, uh, South Carolina bordering on the state. South Carolina, of course, has a lot of great high school football players. Ohio is a short drive. So this is, in fact, a good job. And with that said, let's get into who the actual candidate candidates are. I think first of all, we can go ahead. Uh, I want to eliminate two guys off the bat. Uh, the first one is probably the guy that I think is actually the best candidate, which is Hugh Freeze. 
I love Hugh Freeze. I uh, had him on the podcast. Wouldn't claim that I know him well. But what I would say about Hugh Freeze is that it is going to be hard, and it's, it's not even going to be hard. It's just not going to be done. Tennessee cannot fire uh, Jeremy Pruitt and uh, say it's because of NCAA rules violations and then go hire Hugh Freeze, a guy that does, in fact, unfortunately have a history of rules violations when he was at Ole Miss. Now, he wasn't directly implicated, but that just isn't going to happen at Tennessee. Same with Lane Kiffin. Don't know that he would leave Ole Miss for Tennessee anyway. But when this guy got Tennessee in trouble with the NCAA a decade ago, I think that disqualifies him for the job as it is currently standing. So as we look ahead, here are who, who are the guys that I think are the first guys that Tennessee should call. One are the group of five guys, right? The guys at the group of five that have had a ton of success. And the first one that comes to mind, in my opinion, is Jamie Chadwell, who is currently at Coastal Carolina and was kind of the architect of that incredible turnaround this season. Maybe the best story in all of college football as they, of course, went 11-1 and and beat BYU in what was one of the games of the year. The crazy thing about Jamie Chadwell, though, is that even though he's in his early 40s, um, he is a guy that has rebuilt three different college football programs already in his very young career. Started at D2 North Greenville, took them from 2-8 and eight his first year to 11-3 and three his third year before he ended up leaving ends up at College of Charleston, has two 10-win seasons there, two FCS playoff appearances there before he ends up at Coastal Carolina, where in three years, he has taken them from tw- uh, three and nine as an interim in 2017 to 11 and one this year, eight and oh in the league. And of course, uh, just an incredible, incredible season that saw them finish in the top 15. The other thing that I like about Jamie Chadwell is that Tennessee which for years played boring, uninspiring football under Jeremy Pruitt, who could not develop a quarterback to save his life. Jamie Chadwell has a fun, dynamic offense, which ranked in the top 25 nationally in total offense in college football this season. So he is a guy that I absolutely think Tennessee should consider. I would also say in the group of five, same conference, Sun Belt. How about our boy Billy Napier? And I talk about Billy Napier a lot, but look, this is another rising young coach. I should mention Jamie Chadwell is from the Tennessee, Knoxville area in Tennessee. Uh, Billy Napier is also from Tennessee. And Billy Napier is another guy that I think you have to be excited about if you're a Vols fan. Uh, finished with 10 wins this season. Their only loss, ironically, was to, um, was to Coastal Carolina. They beat Iowa State, which ended up being the Big 12 runners-up. Uh, and a year ago, they won 11 games in a full season. And so when you're talking about a guy that won 10 games in a pandemic-driven season at the Group of Five level after an 11-win season, this guy is one of the hot, y- uh, young, dynamic coaches in college football. Now, the big question becomes, he has not generally speaking, seemed to be in a rush to leave the University of Louisiana. Remember, he supposedly was offered the Mississippi State job and turned it down, or at the very least, I don't know if, I I take it back, I don't know that he was offered. I think he at the very least interviewed and kind of pulled his name out of the consideration. Same with South Carolina this year, same with Auburn. And it does seem as though he kind of understands, look, I'm in my early 40s and my next move has to be my big one. It has to be the right spot. And if I rush into things, um, you know, and I take the wrong job, I could be, you know, my whole career could be flipped on its head. He appears to be taking more of that Chris Peterson cerebral approach, which for the record, I don't think is even necessarily the wrong approach. Um, But with that being said, uh, I, I, you know, I think that's the intriguing thing is, is what, if he is even interested in that Tennessee coaching job, if he's even interested in leaving where he's at, because this guy has been really, really kind of conservative with where he is looking to go. I would also add, I've seen some Tennessee fans say he is a former Nick Saban assistant. Uh, I don't know that that's going to fly very well after the Jeremy Pruitt experiment, but I do think it's a little bit of a different deal with Billy Napier. He's been a college head coach. He's had success. So I'd be intrigued to see if he would be interested in taking the job. I think you then also have to look, you know, look, there's going to be some other candidates from the group of five level. I saw Will Healy from Charlotte. I don't know that I buy that he's done enough yet, but he's kind of an intriguing guy. There's obviously Luke Fickle. I don't know that I buy that Luke Fickle is leaving for Tennessee. Uh, He's turned down good jobs before, and I think he's waiting for one of those elite, elite, elite uh, power five jobs. He, He did not have any interest in um, in Michigan State last year. And so I don't see why he would be interested in this job. 
With that said, I think we should also look at the uh, retread guys, the guys that have are currently out of coaching, but I think are very interested in getting back in. I think the first one that immediately comes to mind is Tom Herman. And look, I've crushed Tom Herman. I've said, uh, why, you know, Tom Herman should have been, you know, Steve Sarkeesian, it was the right move to go after Sark at Texas. And I think two things can be true, right? I think it can be true that uh, it was probably the right move for Texas to move on from Tom Herman. But I also think the other thing that can be true is very simply that uh, just because it was the right thing for uh, uh, for Texas to move on from Tom Herman doesn't mean that he can't have success elsewhere. And I think that's an important part of this. I think it's important to remember that for all the criticism that Tom Herman has gotten uh, for his time at Texas, one, Texas is basically an impossible job, right? If you're not competing for national championships, they're going to boot you out the side door. And when you look at Tom Herman, won 10 games in his second year, eight games in his third year, and this year with all the turmoil, when in the middle of the season you had first you had the Isaac Texas stuff going on, which was a big controversy. You had the also uh, you had the school publicly courting Urban Meyer while you're still trying to coach games. Let's never forget this guy went seven and three this season. Uh, and would have been 8-3 and three had the Kansas game, the worst team on his schedule, not been canceled. And so when you look at everything, like I think this guy's actually not nearly as bad as people think that he was and probably deserves a second chance. Worth noting also that Oklahoma game uh, went into a couple overtimes. It's not as though they got blown out by their rival. The Iowa State game, they were right in the mix. And like, I'm sorry, I don't think this guy is a bad head coach, and I do think that he deserves a second chance somewhere. Whether we get it, whether he gets it or not at Tennessee, I think he's going to be another head coach once again, and I think he's going to be successful somewhere. Finally, the last guy, look, we got to say it, right, Gus Malzahn? I know Gus Malzahn's taking a lot of flack. I know he isn't what Auburn fans wanted. I know, oh, by the way, uh, the new guy in town in Knoxville is Kevin Steele, the guy that stabbed him in the back at Auburn. That would be an interesting dynamic. I'm guessing you got to get rid of Kevin Steele before you bring in Gus Malzahn. But with that said, um, I think he'd be great. Like, I don't, And great is relative, right? I don't think he'd be great, great, but I think he'd be good enough. This was a guy that won 68 games over the course of his time at Auburn. And if you basically, if you take out this year, so the seven years outside of this year, he won nine games three times and eight games five times in his time at Auburn. And you could sit there and say, oh, but he didn't do this, but he didn't do that. Listen, first of all, Tennessee fans would love for a consistent eight-game-a-year winner uh, in Gus Malzahn. Two, the guy did have success against Nick Saban, beat him three times. He won the division twice. And so I think when you're talking about a guy that can instantaneously upgrade Tennessee, I do think that he's the guy. Now, is it going to be a situation where he can immediately, immediately have this team contending? Of course not. I don't think so. But I also don't think it's inconceivable that this team is probably better or this guy is probably better than we have given him credit for just because, you know, he's a little bit goofy and his offense is a little bit weird and Auburn fans got sick of him. This guy is still a really, really, really good head coach. And so, look, I, I just bring this all up to say that I do think if you're a Tennessee fan, I do think there's a little bit of optimism that maybe, just maybe, you get a head coach that isn't as bad as people expect. I think Tom Herman's interested. I think Gus Malzahn's interested. I think both those guys would do better than people anticipate. And I think Jamie Chadwell and Billy Napier are both fascinating hires as well. So that is where we're at on Tennessee. We will continue to update this thing as time goes on. But those are the four guys that I would go after, the four guys that I love with Will Healy, Luke Fickle, guys like that on the outside. Those are the guys. Go get one, Tennessee. No pressure. Find an AD. Then go get one of those guys.